Welcome everyone to our webinar today. I am Chris Savio. I'm a director of product marketing here at GoTo, and I am responsible uh, for kind of all the go-to-market strategy as well as kind of customer insights and so forth for um, our remote solutions group products or our IT support technology. And in particular, uh, the one we'll be talking about today uh, in a little while and most excited about our GoTo Resolve uh, solution, which was uh, just released to market after kind of a uh, aggressive working for over a year. Um, back in uh, early February. Um, before I get into kind of talking about kind of the hidden value of it, and, and I don't want this to turn into anything of a product pitch, so don't worry, I, I will do my best to not make it that. Um, and, and the reason is, you know, I think there is some value, even if it's not something like GoToResolve that you end up being interested in, I think there's some value, hopefully you'll get out of this, in some of the topics or tips or things that I'm gonna cover. Um, before I do though, I wanna give you a little bit of uh, background I guess, um, on uh, where we're coming from as an organization myself with some stats and some information that uh, some research that we conducted last year. So, um, you know, kind of, again, level setting with everyone and I'll refer back to some of these and I think you'll kind of understand where I'm coming from as we jump through a few of these. So <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have seen this type of slide before or this stat in some way, shape or form. But really, if you think about it, uh, what this is saying is that the world of work, flexible work revolution. It's here. Uh, I'm not going to say changing, not going to say evolving. Everything is here today, right? Um, we are at this kind of uh, spot where there is, you know, seven in 10 workers are refusing a job that doesn't offer a level of flexibility. So it's becoming a requirement for organizations. And I don't know about you, I'm, I'm seeing this right now. In my experience, uh, you know, we're doing some hiring for my team. And again, that flexibility is something that is very valued. Uh, first of all, it's giving us the ability to, to hire outside of our current uh, where our offices were, our headquarters were, um, but also in these conversations with uh, potential candidates, right, that flexibility of being able to, oh, well, if I'm near an office, I can come in, can I work from home, flexible with the hours, right, kind of just getting the job done type situation. Um, so, you know, I, I think this kind of flexible work, though, is having uh, positive impacts, but also some impacts on IT, and that's really what we want to drill into today. Um, so first, though, you know, the positive impact of it is that it is making more individuals productive, both your end user employees as well as IT organizations. So in some work we did earlier uh, this year with Frost and Sullivan, um, some research uh, that we were looking at to kind of understand, you know, different levels of hybrid work and, and the next stats that you'll see on the subsequent uh, four or five slides are all specifically related to that. Um, so. This one is about you know, hybrid work and the positive impact. So first off, as I mentioned, 78% of these IT leaders that we surveyed um, said that they're seeing more productivity across their organization um, in general, with 38% saying that things have been significantly higher, right? Um, the other one is you know, uh, a company culture, a positive impact on being able to, again, and, and this is potentially for some kind of counterintuitive, you think if you kind of have everyone together, um, in one location, it can be more of a culture driving. But um, what people are seeing with this flexibility, you know, is is it's just making people kind of happier because their day to day lives, uh, you know, maybe they don't have to commute as much as possible. Uh, maybe you can reach outside of your core zones. They're saying to to find them for find individuals to fit in your kind of company. So again, this is having that positive impact. And you know, um, what we've in, what we've seen from this kind of hybrid work approach is is that you don't need to have uh, a single model potentially doesn't work for everyone. Uh, multiple models do work within a company. Um, and this is also having this kind of positive impact. So what do I mean by kind of multiple models or, um, you know, this kind of one size not fitting all. So, you know, what we've seen for some organizations, and this is driving the productivity, where they have performance criteria, right? So if you hit certain levels of performance, it's fine that you can be flexible. You can work from home. You can be remote. You can be flexible with the days and things you come in as long as you're meeting these kind of performance gates. Um, others that we've seen at companies, uh, you know, in the same survey, 45% said that they're actually basing their hybrid model on the roles of the individual. So where they are, well, you know, what is your position? Does it require you to be in the office at some points? And so an example here, right? Um, I was kind of on a panel discussion a few weeks back was around IT in general, right? Um, and do they have to be in the office uh, at all? Do they have to come in? When do they do it, right? In that role, what I heard from some individuals were, yes, we do want to have these individuals come in, but in a less frequent basis, right? So maybe there is, um, uh, you know, 
almost kind of an on-call, but it's on, in the office, right? So if you have people in an office, you're there, you know, as an IT individual, maybe that needs to be staffed by one or two individuals on a regular basis. So kind of round robins uh, where individuals go in. And so that's based on it. Um, and the other way from a, a work model and flexibility is really at sometimes what we've seen is manager, manager discretion. Um, and so it doesn't have a kind of a company-wide mandate. It's really based on that team and manager and what they think is best for getting their work done, um, their team structure and team approach. So um, so, so that's the general state, right? If we're level setting on, on the role, the hybrid, the flexibility itself. But what about the impact to the IT individuals, for the teams that are supporting? Well, I'm probably preaching to the choir on this one, but it's becoming more complex, right? There's more work now because you are supporting this different world of individuals, these different use cases more frequently, right? So in the same study that we've seen um, is that, you know, generally glean that enabling this flexible work model is hard. It's not easy, right? 76% of these leaders we surveyed said that the workload had increased for them. 43% um, say that it's just become more difficult. So more work, harder work, not necessarily uh, a recipe for success. Um, and really, you know, what's causing uh, some of this increased workload, as you could assume, it's more challenges due to remote work, right? So maybe your team has been staffed up, maybe you have a uh, knowledge base, maybe you had the tools to support people that were in an office, but it opens up a whole other can of worms when you're supporting people that are remotely different, maybe using different devices, they're on different networks, they're setting up home offices or so forth. There's now even more tasks to perform. Uh, think about something as uh, that was as potentially simple as onboarding a new hire, um, you know, in an office that you can get them set up and train them. Now onboarding or even offboarding remote employees adds a whole nother level of complication. That's just one example of a, a simple task to perform. And then the other one, uh, you know, that's making it difficult is just more pressure today because there's more IT turnover. It's been the, the great resignation has not, uh, you know, not, not impacted IT the same as many other spaces, um, that there's a lot of turnover individuals, right? So you have a workforce that has kind of aged out with some people either retiring um, or people now just, you know, deciding this wasn't for them. It was too uh, stressful. Um, you know, maybe we're going to other organizations, the, the benefits, the pay is higher, right? And so that is causing, uh, obviously, reduced resources, usually that were already stretched thin in a lot of these organizations to have to work with. Um, you know, and then the last thing is this, you know, shadow IT and cybersecurity threats, which have been there even prior to the pandemic, but have just increased exponentially in the past uh, two and a half years, right? When you have everyone kind of working remotely, they're kind of, you know, it's the wild west of what software and tools that they're using kind of pushing forward. And then at the same time, coupling that, opening you up to many more breaches and threats um, and that we could probably see every other month, I feel like there's another thing coming out. But as a result of this, you know, what we've seen and we've seen in this research is that leaders are recognizing that the IT teams need more investment. So hopefully, um, you know, with your organizations, you've experienced or seen this as well, um, that, you know, they know that they need more to put into this because IT now is not just seen as a place for kind of this ad hoc triage of support. It's become in a hybrid world and a flexible work world, a backbone of the organization. Um, so the investments that are being put in, right, 78% of these IT leaders we talked to said that there's higher budgets, with 37% of them saying it's significantly higher budgets. Um, but um, with increased uh, budgets comes increased, uh, you know, scrutiny, right? With, with great, um, great power comes great responsibility, reading a lot of Spider-Man stuff with my son, so that sticks out in my head. But I think it, it goes here as, as well, right? Uh, great investment great responsibility, need to know where the dollars are going. And that, that as a result of that, leadership is now getting much more involved in the day-to-day -day goings on from procurement, how are things being serviced, how satisfied are the employees, right? We're putting more money into your team, we're giving you more resources, we're gonna start scrutinizing this a little bit more, um, and we wanna have uh, an involvement. And I think, you know, I won't say for all, but we've seen in some of this research and others that it generally comes from a, a, a good place because um, they know the stakes are high and they wanna ensure that you know, employees not just in the IT organization, but employees at large are happier and getting more value and figuring out well, how can we improve the day-to-day -day lives and going on productivity for the organization at large, where it's harder, um, you know, in kind of a dispersed workforce. So, you know, with that dollars, with the investment, what's being done with it? You know, and I'd be interested to see, and feel free to comment in, in the chat as we're going through it, um, or uh, to uh, add, uh, drop in other, other things in the question box, et cetera. But 
if you're getting additional investment, additional dollars, or you're kind of looking at your your budgets for this year and kind of anticipating for next year, right? Where are some of your investments going? Because what we saw in the research that we did earlier this year is that a lot of the investments are going to kind of the skills and software are the focus, right? So the top four areas um, that we're seeing for IT budgets um, are training on the team. So up-leveling kind of the skill set of your teams across them and investing in, um, you know, tools that are going to improve performance. And we'll actually get into a couple of those specifically when it comes to Resolve, but, um, you know, just at large um, uh, as well. So improving the performance of the team, existing software upgrades, I can only imagine, uh, as well as the new software, right? There's been a lot of tools that were really pressure tested over the past uh, two and a half years, uh, two years, um, you know, with with how can they work for an organization that has to go remote really quickly and stay remote or be hybrid. Um, some worked, some definitely didn't. I've seen kind of both ends of the spectrum. I've seen it here at GoTo, um, and I've seen it with a lot of customers uh, that I've spoken with as well. Um, and so these are, are kind of where the, the dollars are going into, um, you know, and, and so, one thing that we'll have to, you know, keep taking an eye or keep a, keep an eye on, right, with regards to investment is, you know, is it going into just headcount or is it going into the actual tools themselves um, or the training? Um, I'll be interested to see, <clears throat> you know, I was a little surprised when it said the investment budget here wasn't headcount uh, in the top four, that it was a lot of these other things. Um, and I think a lot of that is just due to the fact that it, it's harder to hire these days. So you have to make who you have better um, on your team. Um, but again, would love to hear from, from any of the experts we have here listening in if, if you kind of feel the same way. Um, so that's great to see. And, and the other difference that you don't see on this is, uh, as I feel like you may have had a few years back, is an investment in hardware, right? You see software upgrades and new software. Hardware was actually very low on this list for an investment there. Again, this uh, comes back to, I think, a little bit of more BYOD technology um, with some organizations using maybe virtual desktops or giving people, again, that ability to use their own dice, uh, devices because they're using all cloud technology. Um, as again, that investment in kind of cloud tools and software uh, to up-level uh, the organization in general for productivity tools, IC support, or so forth. So uh, those are the kind of the two trends that stuck out here. No, nothing really on headcount, nothing on hardware um, in the top four areas. Uh, so, uh, be interested to hear again, like I said, if there's any thoughts that way. <clears throat> so that's a little background on, on where my perspective is coming from, our perspective as an organization, uh, with regards to, uh, tools that we know IT leaders and organizations need to use to provide support for end users or even, uh, communications and collaboration software, um, and so forth. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about with regards to go to resolve specifically kind of anchor to that, right? Kind of get you say, okay, knowing that we're in this kind of remote, flexible world, this flexible work world, this hybrid world, we're supporting employees that have become more difficult. How can we kind of save time and save money and work with the resources we have, um, but also keep people productive, um, you know, and then understanding and allowing for some of those security concerns. So there's a few areas, uh, five in particular, um, that I'm going to hit on uh, for Go to Resolve. And those that aren't terribly familiar with Go to Resolve, um, you know, if you go to go to resolve.com or, uh, you know, it is an IT support and management solution, uh, you know, kind of all in one uh, tool that does everything from uh, managing requests through a ticketing platform, through proactive automation capabilities or ad hoc remote support capabilities. So we kind of have that whole spectrum covered and I'm going to hit a few of those today. Um, but we did drop into the uh, chat box here for everyone is kind of, uh, you know, if you want a little deeper dive on the feature functionality, we have a pretty powerful and, and frequently being updated YouTube playlist that has brief 60 to maybe 120 second demos of key functionality with GoToResolve. Um, so if there's something you want to see in particular, or maybe you started using the product and want to be up leveled a little, uh, we cover a lot of the functionality there and we're constantly adding to that playlist as well. <clears throat> Take a quick sip of water here. Great. So. Let's start with the first uh, first place where value can be added for organizations. So the question I want to throw out for everyone first is, you know, are you getting the most out of your messaging tools? And you're probably okay, Chris, what do you mean by that, right? Well, you look at today, um, Teams and Slack have generally taken over, uh, you know, the 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 water coolers uh, for everyone. And I feel like, you know, uh, recent status, uh, eighty something percent of organizations are using one of these types of messaging tools in the market. Um, 
and people have a love-hate relationship with all of them. I know I do. Um, but again, they are very powerful tools and they are where everyone is engaging now um, and where your end users, employees are talking for one another, crowdsourcing information, um, you know, just having general conversations, asking com asking questions about something in particular to business, something in particular to tools, or anything else under the sun. Um, the problem is, I think a lot of businesses have, have not really gone far enough to say, well, okay, these tools have opened up a ton of opportunity to engage with one another. How can we bring more of our technology to these ecosystems environments and make them super productive, right? So are you using kind of just basic app integrations that you click a link and it pulls you out of there? Or are you doing kind of full integrations and looking at technology to say, hey, can 60 percent, 70, 80, 90 percent of the actions needed with this tool um, be engaged with inside your messaging system? Right. And then maybe some reasons they have to pull you out of it. So one example um, that we use here, <clears throat> the project management tool called Asana, you can do a lot of powerful stuff right from Slack or Teams with something like Asana. You can push push messages, you can update status on projects, you can categorize things, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot of people just have things, oh, well, you can kind of push a link off. But if you do that full integration and you up-level people in your organization, that's a powerful thing to use. Getting back to IT support, again, does your IT tool or tools um, have some type of apps or plugs in with these messaging tools? And are you kind of pushing them to the boundaries? So in particular, I'll give you an example. Now this one, we'll turn it over to Resolve for this one um, and explain a little bit uh, about you know, how we are trying to supercharge or superpower your messaging tools. So what we've introduced something called t conversational ticketing. And what that does is it takes uh, the power of kind of lightweight ticketing and moves it to where everyone's already engaging. Um, so within Microsoft Teams or Slack, end users can go in um, and open up tickets. They can comment on tickets. They can look at statuses on tickets. And they never have to leave that environment at all, right? They don't have to worry about remembering what the email address was or a link for a portal or anything. They can easily take a message, um, use an emoji, create a Slack message, off, create a ticket off of it, or you know, invoke the bot into a message or whatever it is. Um, on the other hand, agents as well can do a majority of things um, specific to their day-to-day from a ticketing standpoint right within Teams, right? They can comment, they can see their ticket queue, they can comment on stuff, they can sign it to themselves, um, they can close tickets out, they can change statuses on tickets, um, they can even start a remote support session. Um, and so for that, I think it's super powerful. You go in, you have that quick uh, comment back and forth with an end user, you make it more conversational in nature, right? So it, it uh, alleviates a lot of that slowdown back and forth where you comment on a ticket, some, then you have to wait for the employee to see the email or get the update, then they comment on it, and it kind of drags out back and forth uh, this conversation. This one, a lot faster right in there. You realize quickly, maybe you have to start remote support, and you can spin that up as well. We're also really excited um, by a lot of the other functionality we're gonna be bringing. I'm not gonna tease too much, but in a powerful tool that has endpoints or devices deployed, you can pull a lot of alerting and system information, and so we wanna start bringing a lot of those uh, notes for agents to help you again if you're in Teams, we don't want to pull you out of it that frequently. Um, and so we want you to be able to do a lot of your triaging, get a lot of your requests and stuff done there. And if you need to jump out to our tool, that's how you can tackle it as well. So that's the messaging side of it. What about the next stop? So that is, you know, the messaging was a productivity thing and user focused. Then we kind of straddle a little more. What about things from behind the scenes? So what do I, what do I mean by that? So what I mean by supporting behind the scenes is in this kind of flexible work world, it's not as easy if someone's not in your office for them to just swing down, drop off to their laptop, you give them a quick loaner, and they can go back to work and do whatever they need to do. That's not the case. Most of these people only have that one laptop at home they're using. So if you need to do work on that device, if you need to triage it, um, you're going to be either, you know, uh, making them less productive because you have to take them off their device for 10, 15, 20, 60 minutes potentially to, to try some troubleshooting or at least kind of get an idea of what's going on. Or um, if you're trying to be kind and know that they're busy and don't want to have to, you know, uh, distract them or ruin their productivity during a workday, maybe they can't get off their device, then you're going to have to infringe on your own time, right? Maybe you have to work after hours to do a lot of this stuff. Or maybe this just drags it out, right? Uh, well, we have to find, we didn't find a common time. What's good for them? What's good for you? You know, 
So are you able to actually work behind the scenes and do a lot of this without disturbing those employees? So for example, with uh, GoToResolve, again, this is something you can look at, whether it's with Resolve or even other tools. What can you do from a background access standpoint? What can you do without actually um, going in and needing to disrupt the workflow of your user, right? So with um, Go to Resolve, we're actually very uh, excited by a few of these things I've listed. The first one is actually our device quick view, which uh, I think is something unique to us um, and to our tools. So anytime you have a device uh, or your endpoint deployed on that host, without needing to connect to a remote session, you can actually go pull in and pull up all the system diagnostics and information that you would sometimes have to go in and pull once you connect to that device. You can kind of see on the screenshot up there on the top um, what was what the view is. You can kind of see in real time, you know, where things are spiking. You can see applications that are running. You can see errors that were thrown. So you can generally get, I think, a, a quick glimpse of saying, oh, I know what I'm getting myself into before I have to deploy something on this device or connect to that device, right? Is it really a hardware issue? Is some kind of CPU or I've thrown certain errors that you have to investigate beforehand? You can see all of these without needing to disturb and do that investigation for the end user. There's also background file manager capabilities, right? And the idea for this is to be able to transfer and manage files behind the scenes without needing to, uh, you know, send things over email, which is sometimes delayed, or actually remotely access into a device to transfer something or using clunky third-party tools. Um, this is very hassle-free. You can go in, you can find you know, folders, you can find files and do transfers and queue up things. So that way, when you actually connect into that device, let's say you found out during the quick view that you know, there's a software out of date or there's a problem running, you're like, oh, I know I have to push this out. Let me just load it onto their computer. So as soon as I jump into it, I can do it, right? Again, saves time for everyone because sometimes these files that do transfer are fairly sizable and can take a little bit of time. And the last thing from a background standpoint um, is something that um, is actually going to be released in Resolve in the next, I think, uh, week, I think is the, the scheduled date, the 20, 27th, 28th, um, is our remote terminal access. So really what this gives you is the ability to have a fully featured uh, command prompt on all deployed devices. Um, so that way you can you know, do a lot of the administrative tasks that you would do on a command pop, again, all behind the scenes. Don't have to worry about disturbing the user. Don't have to worry about for your IT team uh, finding a time that's right and matches when they're ready to fix the problem or identify the problem, triage the problem, they can go right ahead and do it and don't need to coordinate with that user. Again, another fantastic uh, kind of way to drive more productivity. Speaking of productivity, good transition. <laughs> um, are you being proactive? Um, are you doing repetitive actions, right? So productivity aligns to being, in my mind, <clears throat> proactive in a sense. Why do I say that? So when you're not caught on your heels and you're being proactive, you can solve a lot of problems before they even come up, right? <clears throat> you can address, you see one problem somewhere, you can solve them a lot, of, a lot of other paces. Being repetitive, right? That is nothing productive about that. If you're doing the same action over and over again on multiple devices, you find the same problem. Is there a way you can automate that, free up your time? Are you doing anything for any of these, right? And I know being proactive, um, you know, eliminating some of these repetitive tasks for small organizations is not an easy undertaking um, because you barely have time to solve the problems at hand, right? And keep your system up and running, keep your company secure. You can't even make that next leap <clears throat> to being proactive, right? To getting to that, from that reactive state to that proactive state. And I definitely understand that, um, have many conversations and that's why with something like Resolve, what we've actually tried to do is make it as easy as possible for businesses to get from A to B, to get from a reactive organization to a proactive organization. And whether it's Resolve that you looked at or other tools of technology, I encourage you to say, you know, does this keep us as a status quo or does it allow us to advance our organization even if we don't up-level our skills to knowing full scripting capabilities or programming capabilities, even if we don't get additional resources uh, with regards to headcount? Can our tools still slowly move us along this kind of continuum um, to really drive greater productivity with our organization. So what we have, for example, in uh, Go to Resolve is something called a remote execution uh, feature. Um, and this really does give you the ability to kind of take back that time that you would have if you're doing things frequently over and over again. So um, this is, you know, a task automation tool at its core. That's probably the easiest way to say it, um, where you can uh, run tasks, automate tasks across one, or thousands of devices, as many as you need. Windows devices, Mac devices, whatever you need to do, you can you can take that with our remote execution. So we're excited. We actually had just rolled out the, the Mac support uh, about a month and a half ago for this idea of we don't want to have any kind of second class devices 
everything created equal. Um, but again, to that idea of saying not everyone is an expert, not everyone has time to go and write their own scripts uh, or knows how to write scripts to kind of automate these things. We've actually created kind of, we've created a library of pre-written and almost a WYSIWYG type editor uh, scripts. So you can push out some of the most common automated tasks um, with these predefined steps. So it takes that kind of, I don't want to say this is probably going to sound bad, that, that excuse of like, well, I don't know how to write, you know, PowerShell. I don't know how to run these scripts to create my own scripts or anything. I can search around, but I don't know if it's going to work for you. We've taken that legwork out of it and kind of created this library and we're continuing to add to it. Um, there's actually a box, right? If you go into our remote execution field and say, hey, what would you like, you know, like us to add to this? What's missing from kind of common scripts? And we've been evaluating those and have actually added a few already, um, you know, just in the few months that, that the product's been live. Um, similar, like I said, with these scripts, you can run it on one device or many devices. So for example, let's say you went in, you were doing your triaging, you found this one device had something, um, then you don't want to run that out to everyone, but you have this kind of automation already sitting there in the bag and you can just replicate and run it to that single device, right? Maybe you can identify, you've identified a few different devices that probably all have the same thing. Maybe they're running on a certain version of Windows, um, or there are certain, you know, uh, certain commonalities of hardware that's, of software that's installed you can figure out which ones and run it to those select ones. Uh, plus you get kind of immediate feedback as soon as it runs, um, which you can kind of see at the top here, the status page, was it successful, was it not? And you can actually go in and read all the logs to see, you know, where did it fall short? So potentially, you know, and this does happen, maybe some of these pre-written scripts, uh, there's kind of a, a little issue with them on one or two of the devices. You can see, okay, where did it fail? Why did it fail? Um, and these pre-written scripts, what I didn't mention, or uh, pre-written steps, you can still edit them. So you kind of select them. Um, you can kind of maybe see it a little bit down here in this visual. Once you select a, a step, you can kind of add it in and you can kind of edit the, the, the PowerShell if you want or prompt uh, in there um, as well. So it makes it kind of easy for you to, to personalize these or tailor them to your environment. Um, again, and the idea of going from reactive <clears throat> to more proactive, getting some of this workload off your plate, as we saw in the earlier stats, you know, more work, more complex problems. What can we start eliminating? Speaking of eliminating, um, this is something that actually swings it probably the other way. Um, so the question at hand here, right, can you provide support for any type of device? In this flexible work world, right, you have users that are going to be working from almost anything, right? Because, you know, I'm, I don't know about you, sometimes I'm at home and when I'm at, well, not sometimes I'm home right now, but when you're at home, potentially I'm using my work laptop, um, but maybe I've gone out uh, or you know, I'm going to work remotely, remote remotely, I'm traveling somewhere and I'm using a tablet for it, um, or I have to jump in and quickly access something on my phone down the road. What's your policy for, for supporting that? Can, can you, first of all, support those if it comes up? Um, and will you support them if it comes up? You know, two common questions. What about things that are not connected, right? What about people that had to set up their own home workstation? This is a common problem. I know we've run into it a lot with our own organization. Where, where does the support extend to? Um, and if the, if your answer is it only extends as far as our current tool, maybe that's when you look for another tool to say, okay, at least it gives us the range to do this. If we want to test it out, um, it's possible, right? Can we help people set up their home offices or troubleshoot different things at home? Um, and that's why we're excited with Resolve, um, that you do have the ability to do that, that you don't have to use your tool as that barrier to say, well, no, we're not going to support that, right? That can actually be a, a business decision that can be, you know, based off of the feedback that you're hearing from your end users, the resources available for your team and so forth. So um, with our multi-platform capabilities, uh, you have, you know, Windows and Mac, nearly equal support capabilities, slightly different experiences, but similar things that you can do across both, you know, because we know that um, there was a stat I was looking at last year, I think the Mac sales for businesses have grown almost 40% just in the past year alone, um, whereas kind of the, the common uh, uh, Windows uh, devices have uh, either been flat or kind of shrunk off again in the past year. Um, we also provide for kind of the mobile remote support capabilities for iOS or Android or Chromebooks, so depending what you need. Now there's different levels of support available. Um, as you know, iOS locks a lot of things down um, and Chromebooks also kind of locks things down. So those you have different capabilities that are slightly less advanced than you'd have on Android where you basically go in um, and support it as you're sitting in the device. And one of the things I'm actually really excited about with Android, which I'll mention here, is that we're rolling out um, 
I know it's technically available right now in kind of a beta state, but by next week, we're rolling out a new unattended access uh, capabilities for Android. So if you have different devices that are running Android um, operating systems and they're accessible, maybe your point of sale machines um, or other tablets, you can actually support those without even a user present. Uh, so we're very excited for that to, to roll out in the next week. Um, so moving from mobile support, desktop support, so physical devices, and I mentioned this, what about supporting disconnected devices? Things that are beyond, uh, you know, your standard kind of tablets or so forth. Um, well, we have what we call kind of a live camera sharing uh, capabilities that, that let you take your end user's mobile device um, and turn it into kind of a one-way camera. It's basically, you know, uh, FaceTime on steroids. Um, and you can see exactly what they see. And you can see that picture down below is, is a screen grab of that live camera share support session. But then you can freeze the frame. You can use different arrows and tagging to point to different uh, uh, different areas that might be a problem. They're connecting, uh, you know, maybe their home desktop or whatever it is. Um, so again, it doesn't. It allows you to say, hey, there is this problem. Maybe it's for VIPs. You know, maybe there's C-level executives you want to help uh, help out on, um, or you know, maybe it's just one employee that's just having a bugger of a time. Uh, you know, getting their docking station set up rather than going back and forth and taking pictures and shooting them. This is, takes about you know two seconds to start up, and probably then another minute and a half to potentially solve a problem. So um, the, you know that that's something that I think is is a lot of value add um, and can really improve satisfaction uh, across the board in this kind of uh, hybrid work world. Um, and then lastly, you know the, the thing we're excited about is we know that while your end users sometimes in a lot of locations, so are your agents. Um, we don't want them to be restricted to just that one device if they have to troubleshoot. You want to take vacation or you want to get off for a little, get off the, get offline for a little while, but all of a sudden a fire drill comes up. You have a mobile phone with you. Great. We have a powerful mobile app that gives you the ability to do a majority of the features, a uh, majority of things that you would do with your desktop. So, you know, running, uh, seeing quick view on the devices, running support sessions, um, you know, even seeing reporting from it. Uh, so you can access it on the go and then you have your preference for, do you want a desktop downloaded app? Do you want to use our web-based console? Really, the flexibility is all yours in, in how or where you're going to support from. And then lastly, you know, I can't say all this without bringing up, you know, security. You know, how is your security looking? What is what is keeping you up at night with regards to security? Um, you know, is it, have you gone through and audited everything? Or are you in the mindset of like, well, this has never happened to us. Um, well, kind of kick that can. I don't think it's going to happen to us. We're too small for it to happen to us. Um, you know, does your security only extend to uh, something as simple as, you know, oh, well, um, we actually have a full featured MDM capabilities, or we're just letting people use SSL, or we have multi-factor. Like where, where is that maturity um, on your security? Um, and this really spans a lot. And obviously, something like Resolve is not going to solve um, all those uh, security facets, you know, things from password management, fit capabilities, and single sign-on, et cetera. But what we're looking to do with something like GoToSwell is not add to the headaches that you have, right? Um, if we could reduce them, great. Um, but we don't want to add to them. Um, and what we actually have introduced to help this and remove kind of something that will keep you up at night is what we call a zero trust architecture uh, to our, our platform. So we know there's a lot of risk. When you take a piece of software and you deploy it to an end device, you're trusting that that cloud provider is not going to uh, give access to anyone that shouldn't have access to it. And unfortunately, in the past few years, we've heard too many stories of um, some companies just uh, allowing just that, obviously not on purpose, um, but you know where you have these malicious actors that go in and, and can get access somehow to maybe underlying architecture and push out software uh, unbeknownst to both the software provider, to the end user, to the IT organization, whomever. So with our zero trust architecture, uh, we really do take this approach of never trust, always verify for anything. And so what that means is once you deploy uh, our software to that device, so you can manage it and monitor it remotely, um, to do any type of action on there, whether it's something as simple as remote, remotely accessing it or setting up automations on it, um, there's a second authentication key that is required and only known at an agent level. Um, and so that way, someone gets in the system, great. Um, but then if they want to send a command over and access that device, it requires a second authentication that's actually not known to go to. Um, it's only stored on that end device. So it says, yep, this key is right. We allow this task to run or this person to access it. 
Um, and th so, so that's, you know, adding that, that fantastic layer of security, which no one else in the industry has. So you can kind of put your mind at ease um, that, that, you know, this tool that we're deploying, this software to make everyone's life easier is potentially opening up more security holes. Um, we did not want that. So that's why, um, you know, we, we introduced this uh, into our portfolio at kind of the outset of the tool. So really, you know, excited about this and I've heard some fantastic feedback and even have made along the way. You know, there's this trade-off sometimes of convenience for security, um, you know, and streamlining things. And we've made a few updates along the way. So if you've played around with this, uh, you know, maybe a month or two ago, we have made some enhancements to the user experience to, to help streamline a little bit, but not rec removing any of those security risks or adding to security risks. Sorry. So that was a little bit, again, uh, that I wanted to go over with you. So, right, using the messaging tools. Um, using messaging tools, looking for background access, being more pro proactive with automation, um, uh, as well as being able to support anything uh, with the tool and security. So those are kind of the five areas that I think go to Resolve Shines. And if you're not looking at something to go to Resolve, that's fine, but make sure whatever tools you're looking at can check the boxes on all of those because it will make kind of this flexible work world, hybrid work, remote work, combination, whatever you want to call it, much easier both on your teams, on your end users, your organizations at large. Um, so I appreciate everyone for you know coming and listening in today. I do want to open up to some questions. We have a, a few minutes left here that we can have some, so I'll bring Norm back on to see if we have any questions that we wanted to to answer before uh, before we sign off. All right, great. Well, yeah, thanks, Chris. We do uh, we do have a few questions, and just encourage and remind people to go ahead and if you have anything else you'd like to ask, just throw it into that questions panel uh, that you see on the right of your screen. Uh, so one question that came in: What are any trends you've heard for IT supporting mobile devices or non-connect devices? Uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. So I was trying to allude to that a little um, in that section, right? Well, what are the trends that we've seen? So. What I had said was you don't want your software to define what you can and can't support, which I think is very important. You want the opportunities. Um, but we've seen organizations that have run the gamut, but more and more have started to look at providing that level of support uh, for non-just kind of provided sanctioned devices. Um, organizations aren't going the path of, you know, hey, I'm going to provide everyone with a device um, because that's costly and risky and, and it, you know, it's investment and does <laughs> provide other headaches. But how can we support a person's personal device if they're using it just for kind of um, their email applications or, you know, if you have your 365 deployed on there and stuff like that. So they are reaching to that. Um, Non-connected devices is actually something that we've seen skyrocket more even so because mobile can be complicated. But this idea of even if they're just using, you know, let's say they're using the, the streaming service in their uh, meeting tool that they're using or something to have someone pull up their phone and look at it. Um, a little more complicated, something that's a little more purpose built is better. But you know, there are pains and headaches in setting up home offices. Um, I consider myself somewhat technologically savvy and I ran into some issues with a new um, USB hub that I got a few weeks back that I needed to use just that to help me figure it out because I had to sequence something a certain way and uh, it was quite a headache. So we're seeing that one kind of, I think, even trend faster than some of the mobile support, to be honest with you. Another one up here. Uh, we currently use a combination of LMI Central and Rescue. Will Go to Resolve end up absorbing Central and Rescue, or will they remain distinct applications? That is a fantastic, fantastic question. So there's no plan to absorb anything uh, today. I will, I will say that outright. Um, so uh, you know that Rest Easier tools there are the tools you use. I would encourage you if you're using a combination of those, um, Go to Resolve does cover. Um, a lot on both of those and a lot of the functionality we just, we just had a release two and a half weeks ago um, that announced patch management capabilities, antivirus and alerting that are all gonna come uh, by the end of this summer into Go to Resolve. Uh, so it'll cover a lot more of what Central has with that kind of powerful remote support that you see in Rescue. So I encourage you uh, to reach out um, or you know, if you want, we, I, I can reach out to you after this and, and take a look at Resolve, kick the tires and see if it meets your needs today or potentially in the future. But again, if you're happy with those two solutions, we're not pushing anyone off them. Um, by all means, you can continue to use them. So, another one here: uh, Are there other channels available for you uh, for ticketing besides Teams and Slack? Uh, there are. So, right, like what I would love to say that everyone should deploy into their messaging tool and use it that way. But there are old habits die hard. Uh, things like emails or support portals, etc. Um, you know, that is uh, is something that we understand people are still going to use. Um, so we do have email entry points, and we're actually standing up an end user uh, portal access um, later this summer as well. So that's on the near-term roadmap for our ticketing uh, capabilities as well. So those will be um, available.
We've got a question here about training new agents. Uh, we've had some recent turnover. Any thoughts on uh, training new agents? Yeah, so that's you know, I alluded to that kind of the, the the study that we did with right the high turnover and with high turnover, you know, you're you're having new agents that you have to hire, so you're not just running completely lean. Um, and yeah, that's you know, in a remote world, that's probably a little harder to do, right? If you want to hire everywhere, you can't have someone sit right next to uh, someone and kind of learn by watching or shadowing in that sense. Um, so, for example, something in Resolve, which uh, is uh, in kind of a closed beta right now and is going to be delivered uh, by the 30th um, with high confidence for product. It's kind of a multi-agent collaboration capability, so where you can invite up to four additional agents into a remote support session. So you can almost run it in a training scenario, right? Like, I'm going in to support this device. You get your new hire, new agent to come on and watch you um, at the same time, do it in real time, or you can shadow them while they're doing it. Um, Additionally, that's where a lot of the automation comes into play, right? If you can teach them the scripts that they need to run for certain situations, uh, these tasks that they need to run, you know, you can kind of get them started with some things, right? Uh, rather than trying to have them completely trained up on, you know, on certain problems, how to do it step by step. Maybe there's already pre-built and then you can kind of educate them along the way of why different steps or things are being used. So, so I think with that, Chris, unless you have anything else you wanted to cover off, uh, we're at time. Yeah. No, that's All fantastic. Right. I, again, excited. Glad for everyone joined. Hopefully you took at least one, maybe two things away. Um, and, you know, please, uh, if you haven't tried out Resolve yet, please do. And I'd, we'd love to hear your feedback about what's good about it, what's bad about it, what's missing. Um, we're always, always listening and, and love any feedback that we get. So. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining. And uh, everybody, I hope you have a great rest of your day.